My day job as a quality of experience engineer on YouTube, on the video infrastructure team within YouTube, is to ensure that one, we are measuring when things are bad, and two, that we're doing things better. I'm the Chris Who Plays Games, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the internet works tonight. One of the things that people oftentimes say is, I tried a speed test and it was fast, but then I watched YouTube and it was slow, and that means that everything was the fault of the YouTube servers and nothing in between. And I, I, I say to myself, you know that commercial, that commercial where they're like, you know, they have pictures on the wall, and then she invites her friends over, and she says like, you know, uh, I, 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 I put pictures on my wall, you know, just like on, on my Facebook wall. And her friend says, that's not how this works, that's not how any of this works. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. It's, it's very much like that. When someone says, I ran a speed test and it's fine, and therefore everything is YouTube's fault, that's pretty much how it works. So here's the thing. Almost all speed tests, including the ones known, run by third parties, and particularly the ones run by Ookla, the people who run speedtest.net, are well known to the ISPs, and they know how to make themselves look good. Now, one of the, some of the ways they make themselves look good and some of the reasons they make themselves look good are completely reasonable. Speed tests are a very useful tool for ISPs in order to debug connectivity between your house and their, and their central network. And that's a useful thing. Do not get me wrong. That is absolutely a useful thing. And when you're at home and you're trying to do a speed test, you're going to get a score. And, and, that's, and that's helpful. It helps you rule out some of the very important things like your cable modem is broken or something else like that. In addition, though, sometimes ISPs will prioritize speed test traffic. So if they have problems on their network, you may see that speed tests are prioritized. And when that happens, you'll be able to get a reasonable net measurement of your access network to the ISP, but not necessarily to the rest of the world. In addition, they can also time sometimes cause the power boost optimizations to kick in because what you're doing is doing a lot of data transfer all at once, which is something that ISPs are generally optimizing for as well. So even if a speed test was a reasonable test of how to get traffic from a particular website, which, you know, it's not, the ISPs maximize the results in a lot of ways, including by like having speed test nodes run very close to you on their network. So as a result, speed tests are almost always useless for general, how fast is this website on the internet? They're good at measuring whether your cable modem is broken, but not good at measuring the speeds that things are going at. So this is a problem, but it's not the biggest problem. If YouTube could deliver data into your local ISP at the same point at the speed test node, all the time things would probably be okay. The problem is that getting traffic into an ISP is not some trivial thing. I know that there's an imagination of how the internet works, right? Like all of the ISPs are little like node bundle things hanging off of this giant cloud that is the internet. At least that's how I pictured the internet when I started working at Google. Like every like there, I knew there was things like level three and XO. There, there are these big transit providers, and my imagination was that every site on the internet was like a little circle, like hung off this long string, like like uh, Christmas tree lights, right? Like if you want to get from one end of your Christmas tree lights to the other, you're a little Christmas tree bulb, and you travel down the line to get to the end of the Christmas tree light and and whatever right but that's not how the internet actually works in practice getting data into this thing is is not some trivial thing it's a massively complicated thing for Google this involves our global Google Google global cache program GGC program where servers are hosted directly inside of ISPs our peering program where ISPs run connectivity to Google directly at one of our 216 peering ports around the world and transit connectivity to ISPs where the ISP and Google both pay one of these third party providers basically pay for that that long string attached to your Christmas tree lights now because a given user can be served from any of these paths whether it's transit or from peering or from XGGC, a typical user on a US ISP may have dozens of alternative YouTube lo caching locations that they can communicate with. But each of these dozen paths has a different set of constraints on what kind of data can be sent over it. Some of the constraints we know, for example, we peer with some ISP in Dallas or Chicago or whatever else like that, and we know how big the wire that we've hooked up is. Of course, if they've only got a one gig router on the other end of that, we can have problems, but in theory, we have a good idea of what those things are. But the other thing is that we've also got things that we can't see. So for example, if I go pay level three to run a cable to my house at one gig and I hook into level three's network and Google is buying 40 gig or 60 gig or 200 gig or whatever else like that from level three, Google can't know my commercial relationship with level three. They don't know how big, how much internet I'm paying for just the way that they don't know how wide my cable modem is. That is a thing that, you know, they can't necessarily know. And so some of these things we know, some of them we don't. Sometimes we guess so we guess based on performance, we see like how well this is performing and we move traffic around. And sometimes something completely out of our control gets in our way. For example, a router going down on an ISP can go wrong and we won't know about it. 
So what typically happens is throughout the day, you talk to the closest location to you until it runs out of room on a major US ISP. This is usually a GGC or a GGC node or a peering point, each of which have specific different constraints. If these slavering locations fill up all the traffic, then the only thing we can do next is send you to something further away or send you over transit paths, which may be congested. For example, your Netflix traffic may also pass over them. As we run out of room, you may end up getting served from further and further away and carry traffic over your ISP's network for a long distance. And so oftentimes these ISP networks are designed to be regional to carry traffic only within local distance. Distances. So for I know for me, for example, when I was watching videos that were hosted in New York versus in, in um, the DC area on Comcast, there's actually a noticeable difference in the performance. And and so this is a, a thing that, you know, matters. A blog post that talked a little bit about that is Verizon's Accidental Mia Culpa. This was a post from Level 3 and Verizon or from level three talking about Verizon that was shared in July of 2014 and talks about some of the issues with incumbent ISPs who are unwilling to provide more capacity local to users and why they might want to do it. That's not my business. My That's not my job, but whatever. Uh, so if you want to do a reasonable comparison of what's actually happening when you try and watch YouTube and it's not moving quickly and you're having buffering or you're having issues sending data to YouTube, the other thing that you need to look for is to try and first just zoom out on your speedtest.net map and pick a location on the other side of the country that's not hosted by your ISP. Because if you do that, this this isn't a perfect test for all the reasons mentioned about traffic prioritization, lack of different visibility into routing, um, but it's going to be a lot better. And if the third party ISP traffic can get traffic onto, for example, my Comcast network as soon as possible, then the traffic will cross the entire country on Comcast network and you'll have a reasonably good sense of what it might look like to be YouTube. And for example, another thing that you can do is run a speed test as someone else mentioned over a VPN. If you run a speed test over a VPN, you're going to be avoiding a couple things. One, your VPN traffic is encrypted and generally can't be seen by the ISP, so they can't do prioritization on it. And two, you're going to be loading from a different speed test server that isn't hosted by your ISP. It's more likely hosted by whoever your VPN client is. But at the other end, at the end of the day, you're going to get something that's a little bit more reasonable. So when YouTube breaks, it's very rarely a single server that is broken, right? It, it's, it's, it's possible, but it's not that common. I, this used to be more common. These days, it's much less common. We're much better at this. Um, so if you see things that are going wrong when you're watching YouTube, and most of you are here, so you can hear me, so it's probably not going that wrong or you'd be watching me at 144p. If your internet is working poorly, usually what happens is you've run out of places close to you to send traffic to, either because those peering links that I was talking about before filled up or the servers filled up or anything else like that. And, and so you're serving distances that are either farther away or over transit or over your ISP back and all of which are bad for you getting bits quickly. Alternatively, some bit of infrastructure, either on the Google side or the ISP side, is broken, whether it's a peering router with the ISP or with us or anything else like that. And we see these things all the time and we work to fix them. But we have seen cases where Google routers can be misconfigured and deliver data at the wrong speed. In fact, one of my favorite stories is a case where I was looking at something and I said, hey, you know, this 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 piece of cable is dropping packets. The two that are connected with it aren't. So we've got a 30 gig bundle here with three different wires that are plugged in. And, and one of them is very slow and the other one isn't. And someone looked at it and said, oh, yes, well, what has happened is that this particular wire uh, detected bit, probably due to some dust on it or something else like that, that it probably wasn't connected. And so it went into eye safety mode. And in eye safety mode, your physical fiber connection, the one that you are sending data over, is going at a lower brightness of light because it is afraid that if you took that wire and were looking into it as a tech who's trying to test out this cable, you'd shoot your eye out. So literally, the other end of the YouTube server, the other router on the other side, is actually attempting to not burn somebody's eye out. Yes, YouTube videos can actually shoot somebody's eye out. This is a thing that can happen. You'll shoot your eye out, kid. Over the last 18 months, we have gone from a situation where it used to be that we had lots of single servers and lots of outages and other things like that. And through feedback and better tooling and everything else like that, we've actually drastically improved our infrastructure. And so oftentimes when you can't watch a YouTube video, it's either because we've done everything we can and there's nothing else that we can do. Um, and, and so it's hard. Right? We fixed a lot of the simple problems and, and everything else like that. Um, but in order to fix the remaining things... I have to know what's wrong. So YouTube delivers 15 to 20% of the traffic on the internet, according to the Q1 2016 Sandvine Internet Report, and saying that it's broken is a bit like pointing at a car and saying, it's not working. I believe you, a car like the internet is a complex piece of machinery that has many different bits on it, bits on it that are breaking at any given time, but, but it's not very helpful to say it's not working giving me more information, whether it's right clicking on the player and clicking the bug infos uh, or giving me some times or dates or other things like that, that these things have gone poorly is the way that you can improve the overall experience of getting information to me so that I can help improve the overall experience of getting YouTube videos for you.
Because my day job as a quality of experience engineer on YouTube, on the video infrastructure team within YouTube, is to ensure that one, we are measuring when things are bad, and two, that we're doing things better.